It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Levine, who is a senior epidemiologist in the Air Health Science Division of Health Canada and an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Health Scientists Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Eric's research investigates how human health is affected by atmospheric systems, including air pollution and weather. Much of his work is based on epidemiology, biostatistics, and environmental sciences. Eric's research is designed to be policy relevant and contribute to well-informed decision-making to better protect human health. And Eric is going to talk to us today about heat-related mortality and climate change. So, Eric, please feel free to unmute and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, be with you today. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, outline of my presentation today will be uh, sort of focusing on uh, the uh, temperature and health uh, impacts and uh, in particular looking at um, the impacts of uh, heat waves and um, First, before getting into any uh, of uh, the presentation aspects, I have uh, a little poll question here for you, um, which I will read and then you can um, answer the poll. Uh, which of the following has been established by the World Health Organization as the biggest global threat of the 21st century? We usually wait till we have well, at least 75%. There's a clear pattern. There is a very clear pattern and I'm happy to see that pattern. So I'll end this and share the results so everybody can see them and then stop sharing and you might have to clear that window from your screen. Excellent. So yes, indeed it is climate change that has been established um, by WHO. And uh, based on uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, they've established that greenhouse gases represent the dominant cause of the warming of the planet. And um, one thing that we see more and more, and I will be discussing this uh, today, is that um, we see scenarios of climate uh, conditions looking into the future <clears throat> based on trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, for, ex for instance, the uh, uh, graph seen uh, here on this slide uh, in the left corner, uh, I'll be referring to this, those concepts uh, in the pre presentation today, uh, something called the RCP, the Representative Concentration Pathways. This is something being used in the uh, climate change uh, science, looking into the uh, uh, projections of greenhouse gases trajectories in the future and how it would likely impact uh, global uh, temperature. So for example, we've seen over the years global temperatures increasing and um, different lines here represent different uh, concentration pathways of greenhouse gases. So the RCP 8.5 uh, implicates that the uh, greenhouse gases will keep on increasing and increasing and therefore will lead to more higher uh, temperature looking into the future. And uh, if we compare it with the scenario RCP 2.6, this is something that uh, according to the, the, the projections uh, seems to be associated with a more um, flat uh, increase of surface temperature, even towards the end of the century, it might even be uh, a little lower uh, than or getting to about uh, the same levels as what, as what it is today. So all to say that those different scenarios are being used in the, the climate change uh, science in order to sort of look into the future in, in projections. And of course, when we uh, refer to climate change, there are many aspects that are, are implicated flooding, droughts, uh, there could even be uh, in some areas of the world uh, differences in, in patterns uh, related to cold spells and high storms and of course heat waves. So this is a um, just a, a, an illustration of the different uh, patterns or uh, impacts of uh, climate change uh, that can uh, be uh, associated with health impacts. So 
what I'll be focusing on today will mainly be related to heat and temperature, uh, which can lead to um, cardiovascular respiratory diseases. But uh, there are also links with other uh, aspects, for example, air pollution. There could even be um, in, the, in the zoonoses and infectious diseases. Uh, you certainly have heard about Lyme disease and how the, the, the patterns of transmission may change over time due to climate change. So climate change epidemiology, uh, this is something that we use as a sort of a, a subfield, subdiscipline of epidemiology, uh, is a sort of relatively recent research area. It, the first studies really were interested in looking at the impacts of heat waves. And um, over time, they uh, have been investigating non-optimal temperature, non-optimal in the sense that not necessarily just looking at heat waves, but also looking at the extremes when it's extremely hot, but also extremely cold outside. Um, so why the recent interest? And by recent, uh, I'm referring to perhaps in the last decade slash 15, 20 years, uh, there's been sort of an increase in the number of publications in this area. Um, in 2003, there was a, a major heat wave in, in Europe uh, and uh, led to uh, an increased number of mortality events. This is uh, an illustration of the number of uh, mortality events that occurred in, uh, in the city of Paris in the, the summer of 2003. And uh, we can see that sort of uh, this peak that occurred in, uh, in, the, in the city due to the, uh, the actual heat wave. And uh, this is sort of a distribution of the months uh, over this, uh, this same year, 2003. So we know that uh, over time, uh, a few slides ago, I, I mentioned that temperatures are changing and there's been uh, lots of evidence lots of evidence that have been published in the uh, uh, meteorology, climate science, that have shown those patterns of increased temperatures over time. And this sort of a, is a graph uh, from a study published in 1999 that even showed back then based on uh, different uh, biological, ecological samples that uh, temperatures have increased over time and we've seen those increase uh, being more drastic in the uh, 20th century. So one thing I'll be discussing today is this complex relationship between temperature and health. Complex in the sense that this is a, based, this is a graph based on a study that was published in 2002 and based on uh, US data that looked at the relationship between uh, temperature and mortality across different cities in the US. And what has been shown in a lot of the scientific liter literature in this area is this U-shape relationship. So U-shape in the sense that we see those impacts of um, on mortality, the increased risk uh, seen in the higher temperatures when it's warmer outside, but also when it's very cold outside. So what happens when there's uh, heat and uh, human body is exposed to heat? Uh, we know that the, the human body maintains body temperature in ambient temperatures not exceeding 32 degrees Celsius. And above this temperature, heat loss through uh, the skin and sweating and and then it, it sort of becomes uh, difficult to adequately cool um, and in high humidity uh, environment uh, when the humidity is very high it uh, reduces the effectiveness of sweating and increases the risk of heat related illness. This is why when we see this combination of, of um, of temperature being elevated and, and humidity being elevated. Uh, and the biological mechanisms that have, have been observed partly, uh, there may be some more, but when it's very hot outside, uh, we may see uh, people having difficulty breathing. There may be thermoregulatory regulatory processes that are affected. There's 
uh, blood viscosity, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance. And of course, those that are more susceptible, uh, people who have chronic diseases and people who have um, perhaps uh, altered immune system or elderly uh, might be more affected than uh, someone who's uh, in, in good, uh, relatively good health. This is um, the concept of urban heat islands. This, is, this may be something you've heard before. Um, this is a, an illustration, a satellite illustration of the city of Boston in the US where uh, we see that usually concentration, con concentrated in more urban areas, we see those higher temperatures than uh, when we go in more uh, suburban slash uh, areas that, that have uh, a little bit more vegetation. So as I said, the susceptible groups to the impacts of, of temperature, uh, the impacts of heat, uh, mainly uh, children, elderly, persons with pre-existing uh, disease conditions, uh, perhaps persons taking certain medications, uh, athletes, people who exercise outdoor, even having relatively good health uh, when it's really hot outside. It may not necessarily be a good idea to, uh, to exercise outdoors and the outdoor workers, homeless people. So whenever there's um, heat waves, uh, warnings, usually uh, public health uh, units will try to target those uh, susceptible groups. So I'll be discussing the um, uh, a study I'm involved in that uh, we've uh, over the last few years published uh, a number of, uh, of uh, scientific uh, literature on the issue of temperature and health impacts. And um, I'll be sort of discussing some of the findings that we've uh, we've observed. So uh, I'm involved in a study called the uh, Multi-City, Multi-Country Research Network. It's uh, an international collaboration that is interested in looking at associations between uh, weather and health. And uh, one nice thing about this collaboration is that it's, uh, it's got quite a good global perspective in the sense that we're looking at the impacts uh, across different cities, different countries around uh, the globe. And uh, we're using uh, very nice statistical approaches that uh, take into account the uh, U-shaped relationship that I mentioned earlier, the uh, non-linear, sometimes we refer to this as a non-linear relationship, uh, but uh, we need to have flexible tools to do so in statistically speaking. And uh, therefore this is a uh, a nice thing of this study since we're using those uh, those statistical approaches. There's also the uh, lag response I'll be uh, mentioning in a few uh, slides uh, where we uh, we allow uh, the effect of say a temperature on a certain day to be delayed uh, because we may not see necessarily the effect uh, in the population on the same day. It may be delayed in a few days. So um, this is something that the statistical approach we're using is accounting for. So the uh, study is looking at the associations between uh, the, the temperature and uh, we're also looking at air pollution and uh, health across. So far we have 762 locations included in our study and it's overlapping. It's going over a period of 1972 to 2018. Um, and uh, we're looking at, it's uh, a study looking at daily time series. And I'll be explaining what a time series is in a few, uh, in a few seconds for those who are not familiar with this uh, epidemiological study approach. Uh, the uh, time series that we have is based on mortality counts. So number of mortality events occurring on uh, specific days in specific cities across the globe. And we have information on specific causes of mortality, for example, cardiovascular or respiratory mortality, temperature. Uh, we also have information on air pollution for the uh, areas for which we were able to get information on air pollution. So this is sort of a representation of the uh, cities we have in our study so far, there may be some that are omitted that are not included in this, in this map. Uh, and it's just showing the uh, 
uh, average annual temperature of those cities. Of course, uh, the blue simply means that uh, the uh, uh, temperatures are, are colder in uh, uh, the upper uh, northern uh, locations. And uh, for example, in Canada, there's 26 cities included in our study in British Columbia, for example, Victoria, uh, Vancouver, and Abbotsford are, uh, are included. Uh, so just like I said, I will just show you briefly what a time series study is. Uh, so for you get familiar, I remember when I, under, uh, I went uh, over the uh, courses I had when I did my PhD, this was not really something that I, I learned in, uh, in the courses because it's sort of a very specific um, epidemiological study used a lot in environmental epidemiology. And time series study, what they do basically is they look at short-term or acute effects. So when it's hot on a certain day, will it affect the number of hospitalization or the number of people dying from a, a certain condition. So not the long-term impacts, the very the short-term impacts. And so it involves the analysis of daily observation of environmental factors, temperature, air pollution, humidity, and there could be other environmental factors. The ones that we are mainly interested in, um, in our case, are uh, those factors. So daily ambient temperature will be the main examples I'll be using uh, uh, today. And uh, the outcomes that we are uh, using in our studies uh, have been daily counts. So like I said, the number of events occurring on specific days in specific cities. And uh, this is a, a very uh, nice approach because it's, it's very economical in the sense that uh, getting the data sometimes is, is quite uh, easy, uh, and I don't want to say it's that easy, but uh, once we get the data, getting the, the analysis going is, is something that can be done in a timely manner. Just showing you an example of what a time series study is using concentrations of nitrogen dioxide. So nitrogen dioxide is an air pollutant um, in the city of Montreal. So on the x-axis, you see here the number of days uh, over a study period. And this uh, on the y-axis is the concentration of NO2, nitrogen dioxide. And what we had for this study is basically the level of air pollution on all of those days over a, a study period uh, for the uh, city of Montreal. So we can see sort of a pattern over time that it seems to be sort of dropping the, the levels. And uh, in this study, uh, we looked at uh, the um, association between air, uh, air pollution and also temperature on the impact of daily mortality. And it was a study done uh, specifically among those that are 65 years and older. So the, the daily counts of mortality were based on uh, pe people that had uh, that were 65 or older uh, when they uh, they died. So this is a, an example of a time series data set. Um, each day is reported. So we have a column here called date, and uh, we have each day, uh, April 1st, 2002, and so on. So we can have a very long list of days as long as we have all the data. Uh, uh, for all those days. So it can be from 2002 up until, let's say, 2018, if the data is available until 2018. And then for each day, uh, the maximum temperature, so just using a uh, label that's easy to uh, understand, the minimum temperature, uh, we have a sort of a variable for the time. Uh, this is the first day, the second day, and so on. The mean temperature, so this is the uh, average temperature within that specific day uh, in Montreal, the relative humidity, the average, and then we have here the average NO2, the nitrogen dioxide level for that specific day in Montreal. And the numbers we see here are the numbers of uh, reported events, the numbers of 
mortality events. In this case, it was specifically cardiorespiratory mortality. So all of those uh, mortality events that occurred on that specific day in uh, Montreal. So this is just an example I wanted to show you so you get sort of a sense of what a time series study is. And in the context of the global study that I'm involved in, um, one thing that we do with the analysis is that uh, when we do time series, we run a statistical analysis called uh, generalized linear model. And um, they, it's basically something that we can run with common statistical softwares. If you have heard about SAS or R, Stata, those softwares can all implement those types of analyses. And uh, specifically, uh, what's written here in blue, the, uh, this is a, an analysis that we're using within the R package. So the um, software R has a package called distributed lag nonlinear model. This is an approach that we're using in order to evaluate the associations between the temperature and the mortality outcomes and allows to take into account this nonlinear relationship that I showed you earlier and also this lagged relationship. <clears throat> and when I'm referring to a lag relationship is, for example, if on a certain day we observe a uh, certain level of temperature, how is it going to affect the mortality events on that day, but also in uh, perhaps tomorrow or in two days. So this is something that this uh, conceptual uh, model is allowing us to do. So this, on the previous slide, it was sort of the lag relationship and uh, the exposure uh, response is basically accounting for the nonlinear relationship. So this is an example of the impact of temperature on mortality in the city of London in the UK over years 1993 to 2006. And we can see sort of a, that U-shape relationship I showed you earlier. Higher temperatures, uh, higher impacts in terms of relative risks, and at lower temperatures, higher impacts as well. So just to uh, sort of show you some of the results that we've uh, observed over time in, uh, in this study and getting towards the uh, studies that we're currently doing on the impacts of uh, heat and how uh, climate change and greenhouse gases uh, have uh, had an impact on mortality events, we first started by simply looking across the uh, different cities and different countries for which we had data, we looked at the relationship between temperature and mortality. And just to get an understanding of what is that uh, U-shape relationship looking like in the different countries. And uh, this is a, a study just showing that in different countries, we have different sort of shape. Uh, and in Canada, when looking at all 26 cities put all together, this is sort of the shape that we were able to, uh, to get. <laughs> Sorry. And when looking at specifically at the uh, effects of hot temperatures versus cold temperatures, we looked at how likely the lag response, how delayed uh, the effect might be uh, across those different locations. So again, we, we were able to compare sort of the, uh, on the X axis is the lag period. So how, how likely say uh, a temperature on a certain day might affect uh, mortality uh, events, maybe on the same day, in two days, in three days and so on. So we saw mainly that in Canada, the effects were sort of quite immediate uh, for both hot and cold temperatures, but in other locations, uh, for example, in, in Italy for cold temperatures, it seemed that um, the effect might be a, a little bit more sustained uh, when it was uh, cold outside. Uh, just some examples of uh, cities in Canada, uh, the comparison of uh, the uh, 
the exposure response relationship. So looking at the full range of temperatures over um, about a 30 year period and looking how likely uh, the curves might change. So we can see that for Montreal versus Ottawa versus Toronto, the uh, pattern sort of is different from one city to another. Now, the nice thing about this is that what we can do thereafter is trying to understand why are we seeing those differences. Getting into more about the heat mortality uh, associations, we uh, can look at the impacts of uh, heat on mortality and how likely the impacts have changed over time. So for example, in this study, looking at um, the impacts of heat in Canada in uh, 1993, so the black line is year 1993 and the blue line is year 2006, we can see that the um, exposure response relationship is sort of different in terms of the magnitude of the relative risk. The risk appears to be a little higher for the same uh, temperature percentile in 1993 versus 2006. So it might indicate that over time, there's been some level of adaptation to uh, the heat impacts. Now, again, looking into the impacts of heat on mortality, but instead of comparing two different years really far apart, we also looked at the impacts, but comparing earlier heat in the season versus heat occurring later in the summer. And for Canada, for example, when looking at the earlier heat episodes, they seem to be associated with more elevated magnitude and relative risk than the later episodes. So there may be different things going on here. There may be uh, some level of uh, adaptation, but there could also be um, an issue that people who were more susceptible actually died earlier due to that first heat wave or those first heat episodes. So this at least gives some signal onto uh, whether the first heat episodes should be perhaps, uh, we should be perhaps putting emphasis on the public health point of view in terms of preventing uh, impacts among, uh, among people. Uh, here we go. We have another uh, poll question here talking about heat. Uh, so here's the question. What is the definition of a heat wave in Canada? Is it a two or more consecutive days of temperature at 30 degrees Celsius? B, a heat wave's definition is dependent on where you live in Canada. C, a heat wave is defined as a period of three or more consecutive days with temperatures above 32 degrees Celsius. Or D, a heat wave is defined as two or more consecutive days at a humid X above 40. So the pattern is not quite as clear as the first question as I see. Which is, to be fair, consistent with the state of the global science. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Wait a couple more votes here. Two more. All right, I'll end that and share the results. All right, interesting. So the... Um, Answer is uh, B, a heat wave's definition is dependent on where you live in Canada. Uh, so different uh, public health uh, units and different uh, provincial organizations will define a uh, heat wave uh, differently. So there's no um, specific definition across the whole country. And um, which is, as Sarah mentioned, uh, really coherent with the global science. And uh, 
Uh, one thing is that if we use a specific absolute temperature, like a 30 degrees Celsius, um, we, we have locations in Canada where we rarely hit uh, two or more consecutive days at 30 degrees Celsius average temperature or 32 degrees Celsius average temperature, um, while other locations may uh, do so. So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, debate and it's on an ongoing uh, issue, definitions of heat wave. Now, relating to this is uh, a study where we looked at different definitions of heat wave and mortality. And uh, different countries, we looked at different percentile of heat wave definition. So for example, a 90th percentile of uh, temperature in a certain location say in Toronto might be uh, very different from what we see in Melbourne in Australia. Uh, so we defined heat waves based on the specific temperature percentiles in each location. And then we looked at how um, consecutive, uh, how long those uh, days uh, hitting those percentiles might have an impact on mortality. So for example, a 90th percentile over a two day period. And this is was sort of our more, um, um, uh, the approach that we used as a, a, a smaller definition of a heat wave. And then the uh, a more stringent definition of a heat wave that we, we use was a 97.5 percentile for four days. So really high temperatures that needs to last at least four days. So all to say that, for example, in, in Canada and in all other locations, the pattern was quite clear is that as we were using a more stringent definition of heat wave, the relative risks of mortality were actually higher at the higher um, level of percentiles and higher level of consecutive days at those uh, temperatures. And it's the same sort of pattern, although the uh, magnitude and risk was uh, a little different from one location to another. And, uh, uh, and for example, in this here, there's a comparison over the lag period of uh, those um, specific heat wave definitions. So for example, if a heat wave uh, lasts for uh, two days, how likely will it have an impact on mortality today and the day after and three days and four days? Uh, so it seems that, for example, in Canada, red line is the 90th percentile over a two-day period and the dashed gray line uh, represents this uh, more stringent definition. So again, uh, we, we sort of saw uh, the similar pattern in terms of the lagged effect, but the uh, impact uh, on the magnitude and risk seems to be higher at a higher uh, definition of, uh, of a heat wave. And some location, it was uh, sort of different. Uh, the different patterns were observed, for example, in Japan, it doesn't seem to make much differences and uh, other locations like Italy had a much longer lag period. Uh, so again, it's uh, those, those information might be useful to investigate what's going on. Are there any specific population characteristics that uh, can explain those uh, differences? Um, now, one interesting thing that uh, this climate science on the impacts of temperature and um, mortality is doing is looking into future impacts. So remember uh, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, the RCPs, those different representative concentration pathways of uh, greenhouse gases uh, may sort of indicate the future trajectories of uh, temperature in, in the future. And uh, there's been studies done, not only by this group, but by other groups, really, really nice uh, uh, publications that have come out looking into the future impacts 
of um, of mortality based on those different uh, pathways in order to uh, sort of indicate, well, if we keep on this trajectory, this is what we think might happen based on those projections. Uh, and for example, in, in one of the study that we published, we uh, actually looked at uh, uh, this, uh, this issue uh, over several locations across the globe. And for example, in North America, when looking at the increase in temperature across those different RCPs, so again, the 2.6, the blue one, which is if we change drastically our levels of GHG emissions that are being emitted, uh, we might actually not see much of uh, an increase in temperature compared to um, this, um, I believe we compared it to uh, around year 2000, 2010 uh, period. And so, but if we look at the red line, which is the RCP 8.5, uh, it's actually uh, going to increase quite a lot uh, towards the end of the century. So this dot here uh, represents the year 2100. So for example, in Canada, specifically in Canada, uh, if we, we look at the same graph, same pattern, but uh, looking at RCP 8.5, it seems that it's going to be a, an average of a little less than six degrees Celsius, but a, uh, an increase across Canada on average of about six degrees Celsius. Uh, through this RCP 8.5. Imagine six degrees Celsius um, increase in temperature in 2100. This can have drastic impacts on a lot, on a lot of uh, issues. And this is a, a map looking at the projected impacts of temperature in uh, decade 2090, 2099 compared to 2010, 2019 under the RCP 8.5. And there seems to be a pattern. Now, those geographical regions are health regions. So there may be uh, areas that are quite large because the health region is very, very large. Uh, obviously in more urban areas, those regions are, are much smaller, but there seems to be a pattern that in higher, locations, more Nordic locations, the temperatures uh, will likely, the magnitude in the increase in temperature will be uh, higher than in the more southern part of, of Canada. And uh, this is sort of based on some of the um, analysis that we've been doing in Canada specifically according to those data I just showed you according to those different health regions. And uh, for example, uh, when looking at the RCP 8.5, uh, the increase would be about 5.6 degrees Celsius on average. Uh, uh, and if uh, it's uh, the RCP 2.6, it would be a 0.9 increase uh, degrees Celsius. Um, so this uh, study specifically looked at those projected impacts of uh, temperatures increasing on projected mortalities in the future based on those different scenarios. Now, where I want to emphasize the results, uh, this is looking at non-accidental mortality. And this study was actually based on data that we got from Statistics Canada, and we were able to sort of project over time uh, the future temperatures and future uh, mortality uh, events, the number, the counts of mortality events that might occur, uh, and, um, and also the uh, different trajectories of those RCPs. And all to say that if we uh, undergo the uh, drastic changes in GHG uh, emissions, it seems like the net impact, although there may be some 
increase in uh, heat events, but um, the uh, cold events uh, might also have impacts on mortality. It seems like it's going to be a negligible impact in the future, uh, in the sense that it's, it's not going to be much different from what we see today if those direct, drastic changes are being uh, applied. But if uh, the RCP 8.5, the uh, increase keeps on going, those temperatures keep on increasing, it seems like the net impact uh, will be about a 3% increase. So it means that there's, there will likely be 3% uh, more uh, mortality events um, in the future, uh, and even when accounting for demographic changes. So those data that I'm presenting to you, they're uh, recent analyses that we did, and uh, we were able to get demographic changes over time. So even after accounting for demographic changes, we still see those impacts uh, in the future. So similar patterns are being seen when looking at cardiovascular mortality, not much differences uh, for the RCP 2.6, but seems to be an increase in cardiovascular mortality uh, over time and a similar uh, pattern for respiratory mortality for the RCP 2.6, but then there seems to be uh, about 7.8% additional respiratory mortality events in the future in decade 2090, 2099 under this high emission scenario. So all to say that um, climate change may potentially result in an increase in heat related excess mortality. That doesn't seem to be balanced by a decrease in cold related mortality. So in the sense that if, if temperatures increase, there will likely be less cold events but uh, in the results that we uh, observe, uh, it seems that even though cold related mortality will, will decrease, it will still result in a net impact, positive impact in mortality in the future. So these findings and the, not only this study, I didn't really go through all the literature on this topic today, but there's so many nice uh, papers that have been published uh, on this topic, they emphasize the importance of public health measures in order to mitigate the impacts of, of climate change. And there's uh, uh, some of the studies we did uh, on a global level that uh, the Canadian study accounted for demographic changes, but some of the global study we did did not. Uh, and this is something that uh, sort of uh, is, 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 is important because we want to account for demographic changes and potential adaptation to those future temperatures. Um, there's one thing I didn't mention is that the temperature measures that we use are based on weather stations. Uh, may, you may not be familiar, but weather stations may be spread across uh, the city, for example, uh, we could use the weather uh, station in, in an airport as a measure of the whole city. And as you may know, this is this can be misleading because um, it, it, it is associated with misclassification of uh, the exposure. It may not be representative of what the urban area is exposed to if the airport is located 20 kilometers away. But at least we use some large scale epi uh, study and uh, some, some validated methodological uh, methods. And there's ongoing research at, at the moment on this topic, looking at uh, projecting impacts on morbidity, so hospitalization in order to sort of um, give an indication on potential healthcare costs in the future, given those different trajectories of, of uh, temperatures. And looking also at specific conditions, not only cardiorespiratory events, but also mental health outcomes or perhaps other uh, health outcomes. And um, there's, uh, there's, there's many other uh, interesting stuff that can be done with, uh, with, with, those, uh, with this field of research. I have a last question for you.
what is, because I just did mention the mitigation uh, and I talked about adaptation without really giving uh, a definition of what they are, but what is the difference between mitigation to climate change and adaptation to climate change? So I will let you read those uh, answers. All right, it looks like we're coming to consensus. Yeah, yeah. I think this one was more uh, clear than the uh, second question. So yes, indeed it is a mitigation refers to actions to reduce and curb greenhouse uh, gas emissions, while uh, adaptation addresses actions to reduce vulnerability to uh, climate change. Excellent. So on that note, uh, I will thank you. I, I really appreciated the opportunity to uh, present today and I'm happy to answer questions and it's uh, open up for discussion.